Welcome to the Milk Bottle e-commerce show, brought to you by Milk Bottle Labs, one of the world's top-rated accredited Shopify e-commerce experts. Founder Keith Matthews interviews e-commerce professionals, app developers, and entrepreneurs to share as much digital knowledge and e-commerce tips and tricks as possible. This podcast is kindly supported by Rewind.io, the leading backup solution for Shopify, Big Commerce, Trello, and more. Let's just say it's the cheapest insurance policy you'll ever get for your Shopify store and all your valuable data. Simply go to Rewind.io forward slash milk bottle to get your first month for free. Now let's hear from Keith. Hey folks, welcome back. Today I am delighted to be joined by the co-founder of Core Optimization, an award-winning digital growth agency on the west coast of Ireland. Caroline Dunley has led Core Optimization's growth to 43 staff and now support digital transformation and performance growth services for businesses in Ireland and the UK. Caroline is a finalist in the 2022 Entrepreneur of the Year Awards in the Emerging Category. Caroline was named Businesswoman of the Year in Best Use of Digital by Network Ireland in 2018. Caroline has received the Entrepreneur Award from Dublin Tech Summit in 2019. And Caroline is a council member of Digital Business Ireland, an organisation of which Milk Bottle Labs are also members. Caroline, you are very welcome. Thank you, Keith. What a lovely introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great to be here. Uh, Entrepreneur of the Year. What sort of an experience was that? Yeah, well, still going through that experience, actually. Um, yeah, totally blown away, to be fair, um, by that one. Um, it's a huge privilege. Um, and uh, I suppose we're in the process of that final is happening in um, November. And we have the, the Entrepreneur Retreat happening in September. So really looking forward to that. I think I've probably been most blown away by the effort and the amount of time and commitment that has gone into the programme. It has been phenomenal even to date. I'm part of, I suppose, the alumni now, which is all of these other amazing business people. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the retreat as much just to meet those, get to know those guys better. But already through a couple of groups that we're on, you can see the camaraderie, the support that these guys are giving each other. It really is a fantastic um, group to be part of. Yeah. It's probably been around 20 or 30 years, has it? Yeah, I think about 25, yeah. And it never fails to amaze me the amount of when you are nominated mm. and you're in, it's a commitment. Like, yes. I can't even imagine the commitment that the after that the winner will have to commit to, to again to go back in to help. Yeah, you know, yeah. But I think, look, I suppose that's the whole point of it, right? Is It's people helping people. Yeah. And, and I think for every entrepreneur and for every business person, it comes back to business is about people. And that really does shine through massively. So I'm not, I suppose, I already feel privileged and feel like I have accomplished by just being a finalist. Um, that's really important because I suppose you're, you're part of this group now forever, but it's a huge accolade for the whole team, not just for me. Yeah, it's it. It really represents. I suppose we're not in, we're in business. What you know, six seven years. So it really represents how the team have come together, and it's a showcase of all of their work and the commitment they they have given to bring the company to where it is today. Yeah, yeah it's it's obviously a personal reward because it is. Yeah, you it is as well. Of course, you know? yes, yes. Um, but as you say, it's a reflection on the it effort. Is. Yeah. yeah, it is. I'm. I suppose I'm representing it, and it is. Yeah. It is. But it. You know, without the team. Who are we really, to be honest? It's, it's those guys that are doing yeah. an awful lot of the work, you know. I hear you. The last time we met was at the Digital Business Ireland Awards. It was. Um, our mutual friend Lorraine introduced us and we eventually got to, to, to sit you down. Yeah. So it's really, really good to have you. Right. Before we get into core, mm. uh, the West of Ireland in particular, uh, the Shannon region, yes. has always fascinated, I think, Irish business people. There was a tax-free zone there for a while and there was Shannon Airport and Tony Ryan's uh, and Avalon's aviation industry mm. kind of grew out of that region. Yes, definitely. Um, in terms of that zone right now, it was very, very busy in the 70s and 80s. So you guys are in that general direction. So mm. does that zone, is it still the centre of industry for it the is, West of Ireland? Well, definitely for the Shannon region, for sure, right? Um, I think I suppose first, I suppose I'm Shannon born and bred in terms of the town. Um, being from, from the region and setting up a digital agency that is competitive against the Dublin, large Dublin agencies winning international business. That is probably something that was pretty much not not done in our industry, right? Um, but no, from a, a Shannon region perspective, definitely the 70s and 80s, and that's where the town, I suppose, evolved and grew. Um, but we have 
everything that we could need from a business perspective on our doorstep. We have an international airport that is obviously still, you know, um, doing exceptionally well. Yeah. Easy access to the States, easy access over to the UK, um, all fantastic. I think there's an awful lot that has come from Shannon and has evolved in terms of the industry. The aviation industry is still huge, obviously, and it, very important in Shannon. It is still absolutely, big, is it? Absolutely, it absolutely is. Yeah. But, but in terms of the other types of industries that we have, it has changed um, a lot. So there's a lot of innovation coming from the region. So some of even the recent, I suppose, industries that have come through is the Future Mobility Campus. It was only recently launched by um, Leo Varadkar, but basically that's the first full-scale development centre for mobility technology, and that's including Land and Air. Uh, Land Rover is down there, isn't it? And Land Rover Jaguar is another one. So they're a software engineering centre developing all of the new technologies for future electric and self-driving vehicles. So there's both of those are there. You know, so there's an awful lot coming from the region that is kind of very much first class. Yeah. And, and, it, and it really is bringing things, I suppose, past just aviation. We have med tech companies, you know, in the region. So yeah. um, it, it really is still very much that international business centre in terms of Shannon Free Zone. Yeah. Um, but there is a mix between, you know, SMEs. We, I think we are actually quite an entrepreneurial town um, in terms of Shannon as a town um, because we've always supported the multinational as well, you know. So a lot yeah. of business has, has actually came from that. Yeah, and my reference there to Tony Ryan, for our international listeners, Tony Ryan is the entrepreneur that started Ryanair, which is now definitely one of the biggest, if not the biggest airline in Europe. And um, he started GPA, which was... Guinness Speed Aviation down there and mm, that was the... G- yeah, and, and and obviously, look, there's still obviously a um, GCAS were there. They're now since been, that's since changed hands. But yeah, yeah, there's an awful lot that's still, that is still happening within the yeah. aviation industry. Very good. Hmm. So, and I think just, I suppose, on the region, Keith, as well, maybe just one of the, the really good things about the region is there's a, a real life work balance in the Shannon region. And I think that in the last couple of years, people have come to appreciate that an awful lot more. Um, like I can literally leave my house. Um, I can, if I need to be in the airport in five minutes, whether that's for leisure or for business, I can be on the coast in 40 minutes um, and I can be on the motorway in five minutes and up to Dublin, yeah. do you know what I mean, without having to come yeah. off the motorway. So it has a huge amount to, to offer, um, you know, definitely yeah. as, a, as a business person and as a, as a living. Yeah, as you were describing it there, I was just thinking about the amount of people that did move from mm. Dublin during COVID. Yeah. Um, so does that mean then that the challenge for hiring for a, a digital business like yourself is any easier uh, or is it just the same? <laughs> I think, look, I mean, talent acquisition is a huge challenge across every industry. There's no question, right? Um, it has opened up opportunities. There's there's no doubt. Um, um, but then equally, you know, people can move um, regardless. So we would have people at the moment in Galway, in, in Wicklow and in Waterford. Um, so as our team have developed, we have had access to all of this amazing talent pool, which has been fantastic. So hybrid and remote working has really definitely been a game changer in our industry. And we're lucky not every industry can do that, right? Not every industry has the luxury of being able to work remotely or work from home. Um, But I still think that we have to make sure that from from a culture perspective, that we approach that in the right way. Um, You know, we still like we're in the middle, in the middle of moving to a larger premises. Um, We could stay where we are and have people in X amount of days and another team in X amount of days. But I think it's really important to still have the team there and to, to have that camaraderie um, with your peers, with your colleagues. Um, so I think the balance for me, hybrid is probably the right balance. Um, and having those people that are remote coming to the office and engaging with their their colleagues and their team um, and working on that collaborative client orientated strategy is really, really important. Yeah, I think for younger people as well. Oh, I've, they need it. I, I think gra- it was a challenge. Yes, graduates. Uh, mm. I had Sh- Shauna Moran on, who's an ex-Shopify employee, and she runs an organization called Operate Remote. Mm. And she is and was, prior to COVID, consulting into businesses that didn't have any knowledge of what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I think everybody is educated now. Yes. But like, a lot of people didn't have the foresight to figure out how it was going to work. Yeah. And I remember having a conversation with her on, on one of the earlier podcasts, and we kind of mutually agreed, and, and I mean, she's she was an authority on the subject. It's not just a matter of handing a graduate a two thousand euro Apple MacBook no. and suggesting to them to get a table and put it in their bedroom. No. I think if if at that age you really do need interaction, don't you? And oh. and drinks on a Friday night and Look, things like that. I mean, we grew like I mean, when you think about COVID hit one March twenty twenty, we more than doubled our team in that period of time when everything was completely locked down. Um, and there's a mix. We do a graduate program. Obviously, we have, um, you know, UL and TUS on our doorstep. So we have a graduate program that we work with from, with those guys. But um, having new people come into the team have to 
work on, I suppose, building those relationships, um, have to understand the approach that we take in terms of growing our clients' revenue it does become challenging. But also people were living, you know, potentially living in houses, sharing with other people. They were working in their bedrooms. They were, you know, it, it was very challenging for them. So yeah. we definitely, I think our communication became so important to us during that period of time. And we went to having kind of daily 15 minute check-ins with the team. Everybody was on. That helped eventually. You could see, okay, well, we might have gone too far. We might roll it back a little we, bit. You know, it, we, it's We did optional. the very same. Yeah, and then roll, yeah. But you're better to yeah. do it and then roll you, it back you, not, exactly. than not do it at all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I think, and then we, you know, you, you try to, to, to mimic your kind of 11 o'clock tea break and have, you know, once every Friday have people coming on, people can just dip in and dip out. But um, the dynamic of having people back in the office now, I mean, it's fantastic. I just love it. I mean, I'm five minutes from the office. I was sitting on my own for two years yeah. going, where's everybody gone? But like hearing them talk about clients, hearing them talk about new initiatives and things that are coming out, it's just really refreshing, you know, and it's very progressive. And I think we need that for each other. We need that to develop and progress each other. Yeah. Humans need humans. We do. We simple, do. simple as that. Yeah. Caroline, Prior to core, yes. Did you come from a digital background? No, <laughs> I did not. Um, I I suppose. Look, I probably took a very unconventional route to where I am today. To be honest with you, um, most people do that, Caroline. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I suppose. Look, I would have finished school and I would have done a diploma in business and tourism. Um, but I I didn't work in it. I kind of was keen to get into the working world and earn a bit of money because I had worked since I was 15. Um, and so I went working for a manufacturing company, working on the line just to, you know, and then myself and my now husband, we started our family very, very young. So I was 18 when I right. was pregnant with Jake. Yeah. And um, I think that changed everything, obviously. Well, there's no, I think it definitely changed yeah. everything, right? Um, and I got an opportunity when Jake was six weeks old to get into an office environment. Right. And I took that. So it was a very short maternity leave. Yeah. Um, but I think I was young and I was wonderfully naive, which was fantastic because I was very resilient and just went with the flow. Um, and I had a huge amount of family support. Um, so we had our family very young and that put me into, I suppose, a space where I was working within and that was in a supply chain logistics environment. And I worked in supply chain logistics for, for many, many years, but I always gravitated towards client services and customer service roles. Really, I suppose I loved problem solving. I loved dealing with people um, and I, I was very good at it. So, you know, I could have I worked through small companies, multinational companies in various different areas, software companies. Can I can, can, can. I can I just say you can that the whole area <laughs> now of digital led logistics in terms of e commerce oh, and operations. Yes. It is a fascinating, a, a fascinating field. area. Yeah. Some of the biggest uh, VC investments at the moment mm. are with, you know, logistics companies yeah. Yeah. Uh, before yeah. it ever gets to the airplane that FedEx already has. Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. it's fascinating. But at the time when you were working oh in it, it was... Oh my God, it was all manual. It was oh manual my God. It was and was, paper. You were doing waybles yeah. and going up to the airport. Yeah. And it was yeah. completely, it was like, yeah. it was all manual. Um, but it was, it was, it was fun because it was, you know, lots of different types of businesses that you were dealing with, lots of different types of clients. And Again, you know, a very dynamic industry actually as well. So I learned a huge amount. I learned a lot about myself and it definitely gave me the skills to go into other industries. That's for sure. So I think I suppose the biggest change then for me was probably in 2009 and I went to work for um, a tech company um, where digital marketing and and web design was part of the offering. And they worked within the hospitality industry. Um, and that's where I suppose I would have met David, my, my now business partner. Um, and... And that, I suppose, I probably without realising it, um, I definitely soaked up, that was run by two brothers, I definitely soaked up that entrepreneurial spirit from that point on. Um, and I grew in that role. I started out as an account manager. I went into client services director for a finish. And I suppose I got to a certain point where I felt like I wanted to do things a certain way, which happens to a lot of people. And there was probably, I was reporting directly to the CEO. I felt like there's probably nowhere else for me to go within the company. And myself and David had a really amazing way of working together of bouncing off of each other, of taking something and making it better, I suppose, you know, and we're very different people and we have very different skill sets. So that was my first exposure to digital really was working within that company. So that was digital early doors. It was, that was 2009, yeah. And you obviously were attracted to digital and found it exciting. Yeah, I think I was attracted to, um, first of all, how immediate the results are, which is, you know, absolutely. And I was attracted to like I thrive on progress and moving forward. And you could see that. You could see the difference that you were making to a client. But also you weren't so removed from it. You were talking to the client. You were bringing them through that. And I think that's definitely something I loved that part of it. So I'm I'm not a traditional 
digital marketeer uh, by any means. And David is very much from a business perspective on the the traditional marketeer. He started out with the business back in 2003. Um, so, you know, he when when digital was like com- so something completely different. So he's seen both sides. So he, exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah. I suppose, you know, coming together then, we really knew that there was, you know, I had a, com- a very commercial and business kind of focus uh, and very client focused in terms of what we wanted to offer. David had that core digital experience in terms of um, that's what he had studied in. That's what he, that was his whole life. You know yeah. what I mean? That's what he had worked in for his whole life. So um, we brought those two together and we decided that, yeah, yeah, we would go for it on our own and never look back. Now, is is the start of CORE also connected to the fact that your kids were grown up? Because you said you had your kids early. <gasps> I did have my kids early, but actually, no, I nearly didn't do it because of that fact. And that is, it was a really difficult decision to make. I was doing quite well within the company that I, and I loved it, right? I loved the company. I loved the people. I loved my role. I loved the, the, the customers. Um, and f- from a financial perspective, taking that risk. We were, you've done it. You've Don't all it, done it, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, that, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is the thing. Yeah. And the kids were at that stage where they were actually thinking about college and various different decisions like that. I so you. I was like, oh God, can I really risk this? You know, and I really nearly, I, I came so close to not doing it. Um, I think the bit that I had to change was around my own head and my mindset to say, if it doesn't work out, what is the worst that can happen? So I had to kind of believe in myself, not believe that it was 100% going to work out, but believe that it didn't. I was 100% employable and I had a skill set that I could offer regardless. And I think, you know, honestly, I can genuinely say I have never looked back. It has been challenging. It has had moments, but it has been the best decision that that we have made. But your thought process there is identical to what most people will go through and when they're in the mindset to go and do their own thing. Because mm. I, think, I think it is easier to talk about. Yes. You know, like, uh, especially when you've got commitments and family. Oh, oh it's way easier to talk about. And we yeah. had, look, we had some people that were completely behind us, but we had people that were very vocal about why we shouldn't do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that they didn't want us to do this. And, yeah. and, and, you know, that was quite challenging. But I think I have such respect for all entrepreneurs um, and for those that go it on their own. I had a business partner and we have each other. And that actually does count for an awful lot because you have that sounding board. Um, you know, one of the things you hear from a lot of entrepreneurs is how you feel quite lonely. You can do yeah. and that's why a board is really important yeah. and you have peers and mentors yeah. that are really important. Um, but we really have kind of bounced off each other and supported each other very well through this from the day we started working with each other yeah. ever even beforehand. So that is that, you know, I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, the the, the business partner thing is interesting because I started Milk Bottle on my own, but very quickly Peter joined and somebody said to me one time, it could have been my brother, uh, people have a big problem when they're taking on a business partner because they think they're giving half away. Yes. But in actual fact, 50% of something is a lot better than 100% of nothing. Oh, yeah. I'll never, I, I can't quite remember who, to, who told mm. me, but I'll never forget mm. it. I think you're, you have to be really careful who you talk to. Oh, like oh, you yeah. don't, you don't talk to yeah. a person that's in a job for 25 years about doing your own thing because no, yeah. you're not, that's, you're not going to get the proper perspective. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, so. yeah. But, but to be honest, like David, well, David was in, in, you know, he was quite, <laughs> he was, sorry, that he completely was. completely contradicts what I just said. <laughs> yeah. Now that I think about it, he was actually, yeah. totally he was. And I think, but, did he but have, it was did, did that he, desire to change and to do something for himself that he knew that he wanted to, very like yeah. me, do do things in a certain way. So and he had it as well. He, he had did, that oh, desire. Oh no, he ah, had okay. that desire. He yeah, absolutely okay. did. Um, and I think like that, you get to a certain point where you go, okay, what's next for me? Yeah. How can I influence what's coming down the line? How can I make a difference? How can I build? And building your own team and building your own approach is was really important to us. And our reputation was the most important thing to us. And we had a good, very good reputation. So I suppose, you know, believing in all of those elements and having that. And, and look, we had the company set up for 12 months, Keith, before we actually exited where yeah. we were and, and mm. you know, had that mindset and and the strength, uh, I suppose, of character to say, okay, we're definitely going to do it. Let's just go and do this, you yeah. know, so. I, I was working on Milk Bottle for three years. Okay. Before yeah. I exited. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Caroline, let's just pause for one second while we uh, hear from our sponsors. Rewind.io is the leading data backup solution for your Shopify store. Did you know that there is no way of recovering lost data in Shopify? If your store is gaining traction, you may have multiple staff or third-party developers entering your store. Mistakes can happen and data can be easily deleted. Rewind.io puts you in control of your data, allowing you to restore anything accidentally lost from a single image to an entire store. It acts as a pretty cheap insurance policy for your Shopify account. At Milk Bottle, we help clients reduce their business risk by installing Rewind in every single store before we make any changes. Get your first month for free by simply replying to your sign-up email. Okay, so roll on, Mm -hmm. right? That's the history, how you got started. Very interesting story, by Mm. the way. So what is core optimization? And I'm going to ask you a question that a lot of people ask me because Millbottle Labs is a pretty unusual name. 
Where did the name come from? Was it a major talking point? Or? No, it wasn't a major talking point, but it actually did come from somewhere, I suppose, at the centre of everything we do is conversion. It's really important. As a performance agency, the results that we got was always very important to us. So conversion, optimization, revenue experts was where actually core came oh, from. Okay. And nobody really probably even knows that, yeah. but that was kind of in terms yeah. of our initial look, it was very early doors. And The, the, the reason I asked that is yeah. because... Um, entrepreneurs make a lot of decisions and put a lot of thought into things that people don't realise and just take yes. for granted. But there's yes. a, a word I could think that it was just picked, but in actual fact, no. you have a yeah, substantial yeah. Well, it's not uh, that substantial. It. It's not a, it's, I suppose, look, at the time you are trying to think of, you want something to make sense to you yeah. and, and where you're going with it. And yeah. then kind of core fell out of that. In hindsight, would we have picked core? There's a lot of uh, um, <laughs> exercise groups and various other different things that yeah. are um, yeah, yeah, yeah. called core. But yeah. um, that is who we are. And that is, um, you know, I couldn't imagine being anything else now right. at this stage. Well, we've, we've spent the last 20 minutes talking about core and yourself. So <laughs> could you just let everybody know what core does? <laughs> yeah, do you think that's a good idea. <laughs> good idea at this point. So, so, yeah, absolutely. So look, core optimization. we are... Uh, Digital marketing agency, digital growth agency. Um, We focus very much on performance marketing and also digital transformation for our clients. We work across the Irish and the UK market. So some of the services that we would offer our clients from a performance perspective is paid search advertising, social advertising, search engine optimization, strategy development, auditing, uh, digital auditing. Um, And then, you know, in terms of looking at strategy and digital transformation and um, working with clients to make sure that they understand the level of digital maturity that they have and how actually that they can progress in terms of that. And that spans across a number of different areas from a marketing perspective perspective in terms of leadership, um, channels that they're on, um, customer experience. So there's a number of people and capability. So there's a number of different areas that we would um, work with our clients on from that perspective. And um, so, yeah, so the type of like industries that we work with, it's retail, hospitality, B2B clients, financial services. So there's a number of different um, industries that we work with across the country and in the UK. So I'm going to use the word average entrepreneur, but that's probably not the right term. But to the average e-commerce entrepreneur that's trying to push, the, let's say, their Shopify store, Magento yeah. store, e-commerce <clears throat> store, up to a million euros, they would just assume that Core is an AdWords agency or an SEO agency. Yes. But you've mentioned deeper yeah, digital well, re- kind of uh, uh, strategy there. Yeah, that. yeah. We, I mean, strategy is really important for us. Even on the performance side, in terms of what you said around kind of paid search and, and SEO, um, we always worked with our clients on strategy because we feel that if we do not understand our clients' business goals and objectives, It's very difficult to align your marketing strategy and what we're doing and how we're representing our client online if we don't have that. So we always worked with our clients on that in terms of, you know, developing out their campaigns and looking at what they're looking to achieve from a business perspective, whether that's from a domestic perspective or an international perspective. Um, But now, I suppose, it's only really probably within the last 12 months that that we're offering strategy as a standalone service. So it isn't that you have to work with us on any of the performance kind of, I suppose, services, but that we're working with clients to really understand their business and to understand what the next steps could look like for them, you know. So, um, yeah, so that's, we definitely do much more in terms of the service offering than when we started. When we started out, it was very much paid search and SEO. Um, Social wasn't really probably in our services at the very early, early days. Um, And again, conversion was very much part and parcel of everything that we do. But our setup, Keith, is like, and I keep bringing it back to this, I'm sorry, probably like a broken record, but results and relationships, right, is the service side, but also the results for the clients. And so we have our structure, we structured ourselves in such a way that, you know, if a client works with us, they have a digital account manager, a digital strategist working with them, regardless of whether it's one service or three services that they take with us. Okay, so then you have individual people that specialize in different disciplines that depending on whether you're going to take out paid search or or social or whatever the case. And it's that strategist and it's that account manager that works to make sure that they manage the relationship, that they excel in the relationship. They're an advocate for the client internally to us, but also an advocate for us in terms of the work that the team are doing back out to the client. And that all of the strategy across the different channels are aligned um, and that, you know, we're not going off in different tangents in terms of what we're looking to do on different channels because there's different people working on them. Your comment earlier on there about strategy and relationships in in the agency digital game, really, they should last two or three years. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. and yeah. we've we've longer relationships yeah. than that. But if you're going to sit down with somebody for two or three years, mm. you really need to understand their business. Totally. But like we've noticed on the e-commerce side that selling has become very complex. You know, mm. in terms of channels, you've you know, should I be doing TikTok? Should, yeah. you, this, Shopify recently launched YouTube shopping. Mm. Should I be doing? You, you know, some people are going off Facebook. Mm. Um, should I be spending five grand a month or twenty-five grand a month in AdWords? 
all of those elements are adding to complexity. And I can understand exactly why customers will purchase those services. Mm. But is there a certain type of client has an appreciation for the strategy piece? The the reason I'm asking you that is, Mm. is we automatically deliver that. Oh, yeah. As part of our service. Exactly. As do do we. But now we have it as a dedicated service as well. But Yeah, but you you focused on it. So I'm just interested to understand, are people obsessed Mm. about the AdWord spend or are they actually willing to invest in the strategy? So when we talk about strategy, it's not just strategy around paid search. Okay, so that's not what we, it would be looking at your digital strategy. So for example, you know, some clients might come and, and it might not make sense for for them to advertise on social or it might not make sense for them to advertise on certain channels. I think when it comes to digital, we know this space has changed massively within the last couple of years, right? And digital was always on, was always on the agenda for everybody, right? But everybody knew they needed to think about this and onboard this. But it was never the top talking points on the agenda, whereas now it is. And I, I think people are unsure as to where to start and where to go and actually where where they sit at the moment within their business from a digital maturity perspective. That's a very good, very good term, by the way, digital maturity. Yeah, I mean, that is really important that people understand that because, um, you know, there's so much has changed in terms of technology. Um, you know, in the first six months of the pandemic, we were talking about digital having matured by 10 years, you know, having sped up. By, I, I mean, they were lofty numbers, right? But at the same time, we know the pace of change is phenomenal. Um, and I think digital transformation and digitizing your business you know, it's not a nice to have anymore. It's kind of an economic imperative for your business. And I think businesses are really starting to understand more about that. They still might not understand exactly what it is that they need to do to transform their businesses. And I suppose, you know, from a marketing perspective, that's where we can help support them. Um, Integrations with technology, there's a massive amount changing from a Google perspective for, you know, privacy has changed how we are using data. No longer can we use cookies and third party data. Um, And there's big changes being rolled out from a Google perspective coming down the lines that are going to be really impactful for businesses if they don't understand these right now. So having a strategy around and, and developing a roadmap around your next steps to say, OK, well, this is where I'm at now. Where do I want to get? But making sure that they are all aligned to your business goals. And people don't always have, we've found a lot of businesses, they don't have the right measurement set up. And without that measurement piece and the data and the insights, you're probably not making the most informed decisions about your business. And, and your customers expect it now. They really do. Like you, I expect it from any of the services that I yeah. am working with. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's it's really important yeah. for businesses at I, the moment. I, I don't envy anybody trying to get out there and, and start yeah. because it is complex. I think that one of the biggest problems that I see out there as well is Shopify, for example, is is marketed as a self-build platform. Mm. And if you log into a, you know, a Google AdWords account, they'll nearly walk you through the steps. Click, 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 follow. This is the best amount to spend. Mm. You know, there's the, the perception that it's making it easier. But the majority of customers that we would talk to, you know, since mm. COVID are, have been selling through COVID for two years and then they realise in actual fact that they got there, fair play. Yes. But they're not winning because it wasn't set up properly. Exactly. That's the most do you, important. Do you experience that as well? Uh, look, absolutely. And I think we can all grow traffic. We can all grow revenue. But I think, you know, and you know this, right? Retailers, like they have different levels of margins for different products um, and different services. And if you can't grow revenue and protect margin, so growing revenue profitably yeah. and sustainably is so important. Making sure you're on the right channels in terms of where your customer is, making sure that you are hitting kind of those key milestones in terms of your own growth um, and looking at not just what's happening on the digital platforms, but bringing that back in in terms of what's happening in the business as a whole is really important conversations to be able to have with with our clients. You triggered something as well there. There's a very... Very good guy. I can't think of his name. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, And he has a newsletter that comes out every week. And this week he issued a newsletter where he analysed the shift from retail to online. Mm. And he's basically pointing out that in the middle of COVID, everybody, you alluded to Mm. a minute ago, uh, everybody thought that it was just going to go straight to online and never go back to retail. But in the States, it hasn't happened. And and retail is actually holding its own. Oh, yeah. I think as, as as people, right? We still like yes, to. Of we're, course. we're tactile. We're personal. We like to be able to do that. But like, what is happening is we still like to research in our own time. And there's certain things I think, and there's certain products that you can do online that actually 
sometimes might feel like more of a chore. So your time is more valuable to you now. So I think what's happening is consumers are deciding what are the services and the products that they are happy to purchase online and what are the ones that they might just research online and then walk in store and buy, you know. So, you know, it's definitely not a one or the other approach. But the challenge for the larger retailers is they have to invest just as much online, even though the customers might never be buying, because online will push yes. them into the retail store. Yes, but but that's and that's not a challenge, right? That's an opportunity. Do you think it's an opportunity? <laughs> yeah, okay. Of course it is. Yeah, good Because point, like yeah. if you know that you're, and, and it's this goes back to the measurement piece, right? But if, if you think you're investing in a, in a channel um, to build that brand awareness, to let people know about what you have, and, and that's actually, whether that's converting directly on that channel or whether that's coming through another channel at a later stage um, or whether they're walking through, you know, over the threshold of the shop, it's still really important to do. So you've got to look at the overall business and the growth in the overall business, you know, as opposed to just looking at one channel in isolation. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, Caroline, while I have you in the room, I want to ask you about Google Analytics 4. Mm. Um, it's a big change. Huge change. Huge change. And for, for us, yeah. it's it, look, it's a code drop. Um, and Google is advising everybody to get it onto their site by the end of July. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. yeah, by the end of July, July, yes. And the reason for that is because, so most businesses will have um, universal analytics set up. Um, Google are going to be sunsetting that in July 2023. Okay, so there's 12 months. Everybody's going, okay, there's no panic. And the reason that it's so important to try and get that set up now, so you don't have to remove, first of all, you don't have to remove Universal. You can set up GA4 in parallel with Universal. So you can just add it on. And the reason it's so important is because we we talked about measurements earlier on. We talk about year over year, quarter over quarter, and having that historical data to measure. Um, If you don't put that in now, you're not going to have that year over year when they sunset Universal in July 2023. So it's really, really important. Now, the difference between Universal um, and GA4, GA4 is now going to be much more event-based, okay, and user-based in terms of... um, you know, and you're building parameters around those events. Um, So basically what that means is that you're going to have an awful lot more information on what somebody is doing, but it's much more complex in terms of the setup. And currently at the moment, whether that's Shopify or any other platform, there isn't necessarily a blueprint there in terms of how to... um, to actually create those customized reports. And that's the difference, right? So you can customize these really detailed reports once you have that setup done properly. But it only stores by default. And again, for anybody listening, really important, if you do set up GA4, by default, it will default to two months of um, data, right? You just, you just but it, it, it has the ability, and again, this is a not only to store 14 months data. So the only way to overcome that is by integrating it with something like BigQuery and then you have your historical data. So there's an awful lot more involved in the setup of this and the complexities around it that we're only finding out as we're going through the process. Yeah. So I would urge anybody genuinely, yeah. like, I mean, whoever you're, you, you're working with or what your internal teams, yeah. you know, make sure that you do have it set up now and then start working towards, you know, building those customized reports and starting to, to flesh that out as you go along, but definitely get it set up today. As an agency then, you've got to skill up the minute you understand. Oh yeah, and we're doing this, right? So yeah. we have have GA4 rolled out across every single one of our clients right. in terms of having it on the on their website installed, right? yeah. installed. The the process depending on the platform is quite different platform to platform, right? So that like I said, there's no blueprint, there's no instructions on doing this. Um, so that's the piece that really takes an awful lot of work with the tech team and you know with the clients and with their web team as well. Okay. So it's an interesting space, but it's um yeah. Yeah, so look, I, I definitely think it's a, it's it's something that everybody is imperative to, for everybody to do. Yeah, it, it, I suppose like many businesses, we were focused on Shopify, but we also were trying to be everything to everybody. Mm. So we were doing we were doing AdWords at at one point, and it just kept changing and became complex. And all you've done there in terms of the data, the fourteen month data, yeah. in terms of setting up the reports, is just proven to the listeners that in actual fact these things are changing so rapidly Constantly. that I think it's unfair as a business owner, if you're a retailer with a number of stores mm. and even online team, to expect to keep on top of everything without paying for professional services. Oh, it's but it's just it's so hard, it's so yeah. difficult, right? And yeah. I think that I suppose, and that's why we are lucky because we work across so many clients. I suppose we have lots of different experience across different platforms, but our partnerships then in terms of our partnership with Google, our partnership with Meta, it, it helps us to have those conversations. Now, you don't always get all of the information right away. You do have to work, um, but we are, I suppose, as a as a Google partner, we, we're very lucky to have that support um, 
for the team and for our clients as well. Mm. It's a challenging space for, and, and you know what, it's actually very challenging for SMEs, you know, because like there's a lot of businesses out there that pro- that just don't have access to a lot of this data. And these changes are fundamental to them driving their business yeah. forward, you know. The irony of what you just said goes mm. back to what I said earlier on. They are the very businesses that are, you know, trying to do it themselves. They so they're yeah. at a kind of a, it's a double-edged sword. It is, it is. But I think, I, look, and just to probably give kudos, you know, like the last couple of years, like there has been great support from a grant perspective across whether that's Enterprise Ireland, the Leos, um, the likes of Fulch Ireland, what they're doing with the, You know, there's a lot of supports that have been there. And I think that has made such a difference for some businesses. We have seen businesses, you know, growing from very yeah. modest revenues and having, you know, a really great revenue stream coming through from their online channels, yeah. but also having the data, right? And I suppose this, just going back to the GA4 piece for a second, like what's important here is going forward, you won't be able to use third-party data and cookies, right? Which means that the only data that you can use for those insights is the data that you're getting from your first first party data. That's going to be um, through your own website, through your CRM, through your email marketing. So that changes how you market, right? So it's really important that we do have these set up, set up correctly so that you can measure and that you can drive future business. Absolutely. Caroline, great conversation. Mm. Before we go, okay. uh, I read on one of the business papers at the weekend that you've just made an expansion into the UK. Oh, yes, we have. Is there anything else as exciting as that on the on the? Or do you want to explain what's what's oh, going well, on? Well, I the just uh, yeah. No, look, I mean, I suppose moving forward is really important for us, right? It's 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 it always has been. Um, we always had a presence in the UK, um, but I suppose as our overall revenue has grown, you know, we've really seen an opportunity to grow further in the UK. So we have been working for the last while with um, a guy called Tom Salmon, um, and he is. Ex Epiphany, who were a large agency in the UK, um, ex MD of Epiphany. So we met him actually at Google Marketing Live in San Francisco a number of years ago and we kind of stayed in touch. But for the last year, he's been on board um, supporting us in terms of some of our strategies and initiatives that we've been doing. Um, but we've just recently then developed um, and started working with the business development team over there more around um, the strategy, the transformation, that consultative um, approach to help businesses um, from, you know, SMEs to enterprise level um, across the board. So um, it's a really exciting time for us just to be able to to, to grow um, the business. Tom has come on as a non-exec director onto onto the board recently. So it's 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 really helping us in terms of scale and approach. And so it's an exciting time. Yeah, it's definitely exports has, re- has always been important to us um, and growing outside. You know, we're very focused on the Irish market, but growing also outside of the the Irish market is really really important. And I think you know, Brexit probably presented an opportunity for us, you know, in terms of as a European agency and a pathway into into supporting um, our UK clients. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. I learned something today, uh, digital maturity. I'm going to go, I'm going to leave. You're gonna, are you going to go with that? <laughs> I won't take it. With it. <laughs> I leave it with you. I won't take it off you. <laughs> Very but, good. But um, I know, look, you, you've a great story. The best of luck in Thank the rest so of the Entrepreneur of the Year. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward just to, yeah. I'm going to enjoy the experience, Keith, yeah. now, to be honest, yeah. But but as you say, you're going to learn an awful lot regardless of where, what the result is, aren't you? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's definitely going to be a brilliant experience. Yeah, okay. for sure. Okay, well, listen, thank you so much for your time. Wonderful story. Thanks, Keith. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. All of our episodes are available on Spotify, iTunes, and Google Podcasts. A special note of appreciation goes to our sponsors, Rewind.io, the leading backup solution for Shopify store owners. Get your first month of Rewind for free by simply responding to any welcome email once you sign up for your free trial on Rewind.io. If you're a Shopify user with an exciting story to tell, reach out to the team on podcast at milkbottlelabs.com. Until the next time, take care.